My name is Michael Redman, and I'm the Director of Research here at the uh, Historical Museum. And I want to welcome everyone to the opening of our new exhibition, Alexander F. Harmer, Gatherings and Celebrations. First of all, I just want to acknowledge the uh, ongoing, continuing support of our Board of Trustees. And then especially, I want to thank the sponsors of tonight's opening and exhibition. Uh, William Burtness, Oswald DeRoss, Marlena and Warren Miller, Bill Reynolds, Sherry and Jack Overall, and Evelyn Sullivan. Uh, please join me in thanking them. And now, on to this uh, evening's program. Uh, tonight we have two speakers. Uh, first, we have Marlena Miller who is the guest curator of this exhibition. And secondly, uh, we have one of our more eminent local historians, Hattie Beresford, <laughs> Hattie Beresford. But first, Marlena Miller. Uh, Marlena is a native of Austria, and she immigrated to Canada, where she married and began a career in banking. She and her former husband moved to Santa Barbara in 1961, where she continued her banking career until 1980, when she opened the Arlington Gallery, specializing in 19th and 20th century American and European art. Since 1995, she has been a private dealer specializing in the work of Edward Boreen and Carl Oscar Borg. Marlena has served three terms as a museum trustee, concluding her, her board service as president. She has curated a number of exhibitions, both here and at the Wildling Museum, of which she and her husband, Warren, were founding directors. Marlena serves as the curator of the Historical Museum's Edward Boreen Collection and has authored several publications on this important Western artist. This is the seventh ex, uh, exhibition that she has guest curated for the Historical Museum. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker tonight and our guest curator, Marlena Miller. Oh boy, my head is big now. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, uh, well, I want to welcome everyone to and uh, I'm just happy to see so many faces that I know. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming and to paying tribute to Alexander Harmer. And I thought it would be interesting to do a show featuring the works of uh, celebrations and gatherings because he did so many of them. And uh, as you can see, uh, some of them are from recreations, like the one of Pacheco visiting, then, and the others are from his, from life exper experiences. Well, I, I, the reason I am reading is because there are several historians here, and if I make a mistake, you know what happens. <laughs> so I'm not going to take that chance. Yes, so I, I made myself a script and I'm going to stick to it. And if it's still wrong, then I, it's not my fault. <laughs> because there are discrepancies between, I have noticed that, you know, there's not everything that one person said is, is what the other person said. But I might as well have read Hattie Ferrisford's article that she did in the Montecito magazine. I would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah, I should have done that. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Harmer was actually the first important artist to settle in Southern California who painted in great detail and accurate pictures uh, first from first-hand studies and observation. He must certainly be considered a leading documentary artist of the Old West, and his art has certainly stood the, time of the, 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 the test of time. But before I go on, I would like to thank some of the people who are part of this exhibit. A big thank you goes to the sponsors, which uh, Michael has already thanked, but I want to do it also. 
and to the lenders because without them there would be a, a very skimpy show because we only have maybe 10 pieces from the museum. So thank you very much. A special thank you to Bill Reynolds who took it, the production of the monograph, which is a very interesting piece here. Uh, to Michael Denman who, who was installing the show. To Hattie Barris for, for, her, for her research. And last but not least, to Executive Lynn, uh, Lynn Brittner who, uh, and her staff who wear many, many hats and uh, they don't really get enough thank yous. So I want to thank them. And as you can see, it takes a, really a village to put on a show. It's not just one person. So I know there are some members of the Harmer family here today mm -hmm. and I have met most of them. And I would like to acknowledge them, and if you wouldn't mind standing up and telling who you are and how you're related, would that work? That's Peter. Peter Harmer, uh, uh, feels like to tell the truth or something here. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Alexander Harmer was my great-grandfather. Great-grandfather. Oh, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Kinsell, uh, who was a good friend of my father's and knew I know we have Albert, which I just learned, and Albert is the son of Ethel, one of uh, Alexander Hermer's daughters. No. Helen. 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 It looks like Helen. they're always getting mixed up. Okay. <laughs> See, I'm already wrong. <laughs> so, so, you're Albert, and you are the son of Helen. Helen, right. And Helen was the daughter of Alexander. So, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Now, who else do we have? There are more Harmers here. <laughs> I'm Peter's brother, Jim. You're He's Peter's? My great grandson. Oh, all right. They're very good. So, have we got them all? I thought there were more. Somebody is marrying somebody. <laughs> my daughter's marrying Alexander Harmer, the great, great, great grandson. Well, there you go. <laughs> Interesting. And then I was handed this fabulous document by Albert. Thank you. This is the family tree. Ooh. And if you're nice to me, I'll share it. <laughs> <laughs> I got it now. So I, I guess there is Peter. Yeah, we got Peter, great grandson and wife. We got the wife too. There she is. Hi. Now, who is Tatiana Parsons? That's you. Yeah, that's I'm getting daughter. to know everybody. And you are the... Well, Tatiana is our daughter, who marries Alexander the Sox. Oh, so you're together. Okay. Now, let's learn a little bit about the artist. Alexander mm -hmm. Harmer was a most interesting individual, to say the least. And because he moved around so much, I knew I couldn't keep up the dates. And since there are several historians here, I did not want to... Talking, be talking off the cuff. I did, I did neglect to say something because somebody is missing here. It's the uh, president, uh, the board president, which is my husband, Warren, and he's in the hospital recovering from uh, surgery. But I want everybody to know that he's doing fine. They had removed part of his, well, one, one lobe of the lung and the, another part, but I think it is not cancerous, so we're all happy. So back to, back to Alexander Harmer. He was born in Newark, New Jersey in 1856, one of 10 children. And already as a child, his strongest passion was to become a painter and to explore the American West. At age 13, four years after the Civil War, he left home and began his life of travels, heading west as far as Lincoln, Nebraska. But there was little incentive for a young man with artistic ambition in Lincoln. So after three years, he returned east, intending to pursue studies at the renowned Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. However, his funds run, uh, took him only as far as Cincinnati, Ohio, where he joined the United States Army, so he could realize his long-held goal of seeing the West. At age 16, he enlisted in the Army but to be eligible, he had to give his age as 20. He was stationed in California where he was a member of the U.S. Cavalry. He was appointed hospital steward with the rank of Sergeant of Ordnance. 
although the Army held promise and advancement for him, and he had signed up for five, a five-year enlistment, he requested to be discharged after one year to concentrate on his painting. This time he made it to Philadelphia and worked in a photography studio, spending all of his free time sketching and painting. This was the first of three periods of study at the Academy, initially under, under the guidance of Thomas Eakins. Harmer left the Academy after two years, but remained in Philadelphia and studied on his own. When his funds once again ran low, he rejoined the Army so he could return to the West. And he enlisted as a private in the 6th Cavalry Regiment assigned to Fort Apache, Arizona, and as before, he was quickly promoted to corporal and then sergeant. And once again, he was granted a position as hospital steward. In the spring of 1883, at age 27, he joined a field expedition into Mexico to pursue the Apaches led by Geronimo. Harmer was present when Geronimo was captured for the third, but not the last time. Harmer did numerous sketches during this exped expedition, which he later used to create dozens of drawings, paintings, and illustrations for magazines. After this time in the Army, Harmer returned briefly to Philadelphia and the Academy, but decided that the West was his permanent home. He spent some time in Mexico and explored the California coast. For a short time, he set up a studio in San Francisco and began to sketch the California missions in their conditions as they were at the time. And he studied and researched how they looked originally. And these were reproduced in several of Father Engelhardt's histori histories of the missions. There are a couple of drawings out here that he did. Sometime during the 1880s, Harmer met Charles Fletcher Loomis, a journalist and preservationist, who was also concerned about the decay of the missions. Loomis was also the founder of the Los Angeles-based magazine, The Land of Sunshine, which was a compilation of peace, of prose, I mean, of <laughs> peace, poetry and art. And from almost two decades, Loomis used Harmer's illustrations to accompany his stories and articles. In 1889, Harmer took a short leave from California for a final period of study at the Philadelphia Academy and to spend a year in Mexico. And through his French friendship with Loomis, he was introduced to the Lavalle family, said to be one of the last old Spanish families who retained the custom of their Hispanic heritage. Their family rancho, called Camulos, was the setting for Helen Hunt Jackson's famous novel, Ramona. Their Harmer witnessed family reenactments that inspired him to enter into a new and important phase of his work, the recreation of scenes from life in California. And through the Del Valle family, Harmer met Felicidad, the beautiful daughter of Refugio Dominique Abadi. They too, they too were descendants of an early California family. Harmer and Felicidad fell in love and married in 1893 here in Santa Barbara at Our Lady of Sorrows Church. After a year of settling Harmer's affairs in San Francisco, the couple moved to Santa Barbara and moved into Felicidad's family home, the Yorba Abadi Adobe, facing the De La Guerra Plaza. There they raised their seven children, four girls and three boys. Harmer established a studio in the clock building in 1894, which according to Hattie, is at 934 and a half State Street. And the following year, they moved to the Holly Block at 1229 and a half State Street. I got that from your article, thank you. <laughs> in 1906, Harmer built a series of four adjacent studios on the grounds of the Adobe thereby creating one of the first art colonies on the West Coast. And a number of artists, including Thomas Moran, Colin Campbell Cooper, Albert and Adele Herder, Edward Barine and his wife Lucille, Carlos Gaborg and John Gamble, all worked in these studios. Now Harmer's focus shifted entirely towards the revival of the early days of Alta California. He posed his wife and members of her family as his subjects in many of his works incorporating the costumes and accessories passed down to her. 
Harmer supported himself and his family by taking commissions for illustrations in peri periodicals and magazines, and for local clients such as Hunt's China Shop, who commissioned him to do several projects. One of these commissions was the California Mission Series, which was applied to collector's plates and produced by Wedgwood China. I remember I had a couple of those. Hunt also commissioned Harmer to paint a series of oil paintings for the store. These paintings were so popular that Hunt later reproduced them in a series of calendars. You will see some of these uh, reproductions in, uh, in the ca cases out here. Alexander Francis Harmer died on January 10, 1925, at the age of 69, watching one of our beautiful sunsets Ironically, that same day, he had received a note from his friend Charlie Russell, which began, here's hoping your trail is a long one. Mm -hmm. Isn't that sad? So um, I did my reading, and now you will hear some interpretation of some of the paintings that you see here, and Hattie will do that expertly. And after we are done, then we, we can go outside and have a little libation and some goodies. <laughs> and then they will remove the chairs and then you can all come in and look at the artwork. So Hattie, I have, I'm i gonna introduce you just a minute. I, I got your bio. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Hattie Beresford is a former English and American his history teacher who writes the way it was column for the Montecito Journal. She has written two notices for the Santa Barbara Historic Museum, and together with Michael Redman and the museum, produced the memoirs of local artist Elizabeth Eaton Burton. A native of Holland, she appreciates living in a town that has such a rich history. When her nose is not immersed in some dusty <laughs> tome of flaking newspaper, ferreting out new stories, she enjoys visiting historic sites. For well, this ex exhibition, that meant a visit to Rancho Camulos to view clips from the 1910 and 1916 silent film version of, uh, versions of Ramona. So you saw that? Okay, it also meant a trip to Rancho de la Cuesta on Santa Rosa, uh, on Santa, Santa Rosa Road in Buellton, which is this painting here, where the old adobe still stands as part of the Mosby most Winery. So please welcome Hattie and uh, enjoy what she has to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try to make sure everyone can hear. Is everything yep. working back there? Yes, you can hear me back there. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Marlena for putting this absolutely beautiful, beautiful exhibition together. And if we could all give her a really big hand. <laughs> Amazing amount of work. Marlena asked me to talk a little bit about some of the paintings. And um, so I went and researched what I could. I think a lot of the paintings are still sort of a mystery to us today. And I think that somewhere out there, there's someone who wrote it all down a long, long time ago, and I'm still looking for that information. But I was able to find a few things. And I was also able to find Rosario Curletti's interview with Inez Harmer Northrup. And it's a beautiful memoir of life with her father. And so I'm probably going to mention a few things from that as well. Um, Harmer basically became famous because of his uh, sketchings, drawings, and paintings of the American Indian tribes of the Southwest. And he was already being published in Harper's Magazine and a lot of other magazines uh, with, where his work was published with scholarly articles about the Indians. Um, it wasn't until he came to Santa Barbara that he really became the, off, the artist of the old California days in, in, um, in California, in Southern California, and especially in Santa Barbara. The, um, and his friendship with uh, Loomis was a deep one. In fact, Inez remembers that um, they called him Don Carlos. Uh, Don Carlos always had a room at our house set aside for him. 
His white hair and velvet jackets were a joy to us all. So this was a deep and inviting friendship. And he had indeed, uh, Lummis had indeed uh, introduced Felicidad to Harmer. And one of the paintings that you see here, this one called Moonlight, I'm not gonna go over there, I can't, I can't leave the mic. Moonlight over here is a picture of basically a photograph, at least the, the dancing couple, come from a photograph that, that Lummis created in 1887 at Rancho Camulos. And you just transpose, you can, I have the photograph with me and I'll be glad to show it to you later. If you just transpose those dancers, that's who they are. That's Felicidad, Felicidad and Don Coronel de Valle dancing uh, La Cuna. And it's, uh, it's just wonderful to see these images keep coming up over and over again in his paintings. One of the ones that really mystified all of us when we first saw this was, was this painting right here. It's called uh, La Rafa de los um, de Comadres y Compadres. Now, uh, Rafa is actually a nickname for Rafael, so that didn't quite make any sense to me until I looked up what it meant in a 1930 newspaper where this painting had been created for Jane Stanford and hung at Stanford uh, University for a long time. And with it was the fact that this was a raffle, a lottery, by which they chose the godparents. And the little girl on the table is reaching into a receptacle of some sort and picking out those names. You can see in the far right corner of this painting that there are musicians. And if you look at the headdress and some of the clothing, you'll see that they are probably um, American uh, Chumash Indians, uh, at least one of the musicians is. And you'll see this certain headdress and this certain musician appearing in many of the paintings, if you really pay attention to it. It's really kind of a nice puzzle. Um, he was a prolific illustrator, even after uh, 1893 when he married Felicidad. And there was a magazine at the time called The Californian. And I looked through and just thumbed through the volume, collected volume of one year, and ran across at least 10 articles that were illustrated by Harmer. He illustrated somebody else's poem. He illustrated somebody else's short story with wagon trains and log cabins. And he illustrated two scholarly articles on the Southwest Indians in that. And we have that. Um, and, but what was most interesting to me was that he illustrated the story of the wild woman of St. Nicholas Island, San Nicholas Island. So that was pretty interesting too, because we all know that story, the, you know, Scott O'Dell, the Island of the Blue Dolphins. We know this story from a lot of different sources, and it's in the 1893 Californian. He also did book illustrations, um, and I have Jim Main here to thank for some of this information that I'm going to give you, and I hope I got it right, Jim. Um, basically, the book illustrations were done through a process called photogravure. And what that is is that Harmer would paint um, a painting using just tonal qualities, which was called en grisé. I believe I'm saying that right. And then they would take a photograph of it on a glass plate. And then from that photograph, they would somehow reduce it to the size it needed to be for the book, and, on, and um, develop it onto a metal plate with certain chemicals on it that would then etch the metal plate, and then it would become possible to create a photographic image of a painting for a book. The newspapers at the time did this too. It's a very complicated, very expensive process. You couldn't do it on newsprint. You had to do it on smooth paper. And so when you look in the... Um, the display cases, you'll see some examples of that as well. And in this other room, you'll see the original paintings from which those uh, book plates were made. It was, it was just fascinating. Um, he also, um, he illustrated for local, art, local authors. One was Carl Gray. And Carl Gray was a pseudonym of Dr. Charles Caldwell Park of Montecito. He came here in 1893. He, um, he and his wife immediately took on the preservation of the Hispanic culture in Santa Barbara. They had gatherings and meetings. His wife 
uh, would invite her friends over and they would learn the Spanish dances because they really wanted to preserve this aspect of our history. And um, uh, Carl Gray, or Park, wrote a plaything of the gods, the story of Joaquin Murrieta, and this was illustrated by Harmer. Um, if you can get through the thou hast these, wouldst thou please the uh, language of the story, it's actually pretty engaging, but you have to get used to that. And he also illustrated another book called The Romance on El Camino Real, and that book, um, we'll see some, you'll see some of the um, gouache paintings for that book out there as well. And uh, this was written by Jarrett T. Richards, an attorney in town, and the painting of Carmelita and Pancho, who are playing and singing um, in one of these um, gouache paintings. We, the museum has, is this the dress? Mm -hmm. Okay, the museum has the... No, the, this is not the dress. That's yeah. not the dress, okay, but with the museum... The museum has the dress and the guitar. The, has the dress and the guitar yeah. that was actually used as a model for for this particular painting. So it all goes way back. Um, Ines says that when her father was a lad of 13 or 14 and making his way west, he took any kind of job that he could possibly get. And one of the things that he used to, um, he, he spent quite a bit of time working for the theater. And uh, he must have because he learned the entire score to HMS Pinafore and also the entire score to the Mikado. And so he would sing these songs to his family. And Felicidad also had a musical bent. They would go to a concert, and she would come home and play the whole thing on the piano in completely, the entire concert. Must have had an incredible ear. And what in invariably what happened is that people would come and stand on their veranda and listen to her playing. And if, the, if it was raining or it was very cold, they'd knock on the door and see if they could please come inside and, and listen. And uh, Ines says she and her, her brother Bertie would invariably end the evening by doing the cakewalk and then everyone would say goodbye and goodnight. So I just love that story. Um, as far as the other paintings go, um, lots of, they're mostly, you know, they're pretty intensively captioned with information, but um, this one right here, this one is, uh, Marlena pointed out, is uh, Rancho de la Cuesta, or Rancho La Vega, and this person in here, the woman with the black mantilla on, that's sort of in the center of a cluster of men, if you really look, they're pots of gold, and they're, they're playing Monty. And uh, she is the house, and so they can only bet as much as money as she has put out for the bank at that particular time. But I, she looks to be doing quite well. And she's, suppo <laughs> she's supposed to be the wife of um, Dr. Ramon de la Cuesta. Her name was um, Micaela Cota. And then if you look here, you'll see one of the guests at this event is uh, in white uh, with the red mantilla, red shawl. That is uh, a portrait of Felicidad. She, put, she was the uh, model for that. And what I love even more about this is that this one has a bit of humor in it. If you look way over to the right, you'll see two boys dipping into a giant barrel of wine or aguardiente and then spitting it out at the dog. So, so be sure you come over and take a real close look at that uh, later on. Have to have a dog, right? Yes. Yeah, he had dogs for a, for a while. He would put, and it was always the same dog. It was always this dog, okay? Or several versions of that dog, maybe five of them, but they all looked exactly alike. Um, I don't know what the story is behind that. I'd love to find out. Okay. Um, one of the, what, what we really love over here is that Alexander Harmer in eight, 1908 painted the poster for the coming of the Great White Fleet. Now, um, if that's, if your history's a little foggy, President Theodore Roosevelt in 1907 sent 16 battleships on a round the world cruise, had them painted white with gold scroll work they were supposed to be on a diplomatic mission. Some people said, 
were a little more cynical than that and said, no, this was really to show the world that we had a lot of might and uh, they better not mess with us. Uh, but whatever, they were welcomed almost everywhere. One town in South America refused to acknowledge them. They, it was Christmas Eve and they completely, the, the governor of the, of the town said, no celebrations. They didn't want anything to appear like they were welcoming the great white fleet to their town. But they were certainly welcomed here in Santa Barbara and Alexander Harmer was on the committee along with Rob Wagner and a lot of other artists that were in charge of planning the floral parade and Battle of the Flowers that was part of the three-day celebration of this event. And so he, Harmer, created the poster and he also created the carriage. Joel Remington Fithian donated the carriage to have it be used for this particular event. And um, they, they, they built it in Harmer's backyard. And Ines says that he also designed all the costumes, which were made of white duck. All the reins were of sateen. They were gold, just as you're seeing here in the painting um, on this side. And he, um, he painted the hats, he painted the decorations on the, on the, on the pants of the, the trousers of, of the outriders and the footmen and the, and the drivers of the event. And when you look at the, the uh, display cases, you'll see there's a photograph that looks remarkably like this because what would happen is the first thing that happened, it was the Admiral's float. Admiral Thomas and the principal officers of the fleet were taken to the grandstand. The float went back down, or the carriage went back down, picked up all the prominent women from the De La Guerra family, and then as they started back up toward the grandstand, the flower, Battle of the Flowers began. And everybody in the grandstand was armed with ammunition, all the sailors were armed with ammunition and they were just throwing this at all of the floats that were going by. So that was the typical battle of the flowers. And so the painting on the left over here um, is pretty amazing because it shows it in its mass hysteria. The officers have climbed out of the grandstand, they've joined in on the battle of the flowers and it's a very active, active um, painting. And this painting is of the Admiral's float and all of the people who were participated in this are named on the back of the on the back of the, the painting. It's really quite amazing. And it was loaned to us by Joel Adams Fithian. Is he here today? Or? He was supposed to be. Is Joel here? Very dark. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I got to see this a while ago, and um, it's so so. All of these paintings have stories. All of these paintings have, um, and we know some of them, we don't know others. Oh, there's one, where's the one, Marlena, of the, um, the one, yours, is that in the other room? Yeah. Oh, there's one of the mission scene that you have to go and take a look at because in, you'll see everyone's eyes are pointing to something, you know, looking toward a center focal point, and then you'll see these two men and it's all up, it's off, it's Sunday, it's in front of the church, and it looks like they're having a mock bullfight or a wrestling match or something, but it's very, very interesting. And if you really start looking at each of the people in each of the pictures, because lots of times he painted individual people, and so we don't know who they are today, but at that time, if somebody saw his painting, they could recognize themselves. His kids often said they were completely surprised because they'd show up in all of these paintings, and they had no idea that he was doing that to them. Anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, exhibit. I, I, I hope you enjoy it as much as I have gotten such a wonderful chance to, to work on this and learn so much, and I'm very happy to have shared it with you, and I hope uh, you enjoy it. So if you have any questions, I'll be around to answer them afterwards, but I think we're ready to go have some libations right now. Thank you. Congratulations to our guest curator. A flower for the flower, right? <laughs> Thank you so much.
ya tiene los que la compra a medio real.